Okay, so in this particular uh, lesson, we're going to go ahead and look at some branching uh, and nested branching at that. We're also going to start seeing how we're going to ask the user for information and use that information in our programs. So uh, what we have here in the uh, code editor already is a code that's from 134. It's at the very start, uh, number one. The uh, quickest and easiest way to uh, get this into your code editor is just to copy it. Uh, just copy it and paste it. So I'm going to drag the assignment in real quick so you can see. Uh, here's the assignment, right? If, I, if I'm still on the web page, or you can even do this in the Word document as well, if you have the Word document equivalent, you can just basically cursor right here at the function, and then it'll only copy just the function itself. And then you can copy this and paste it into your program, okay? Um, when you select it, don't select the line numbers, because if you select the line numbers as well, it's going to paste those line numbers on top of the line numbers that are already in the program. So, um, you know, then you're just going to have to go back and delete all that. So, you know, try not to do that. So this particular function uh, is provided for you. And what it says in, in this uh, assignment is it's going to basically tell us um, what category certain inputs are in. Okay, so for example, we're going to see that it's going to re re return the categorization of food. Sorry, my um, speech today. So uh, it gives us a couple of settings. It gives us a couple of um, different fruits or different vegetables that we can throw in here. And then it's going to return what kind of uh, fruit or vegetable it is. Okay. So for example, if I go ahead and run this function, right? All right, oops, I have an unindent. What happened here? Oh, that's me. I just means it didn't indent that all once. There we go. Okay, so there's an extra space in there. You may get that error too if you do the copy and paste. Um, so, all right, now the function's stored. So if I try this like this, okay, if I do food ID and then, oops, and then open a set of parentheses, type the food. So for example, if I type apple, right? If I type apple and press enter, it's going to return that it is not citrus, but it is fruit. Okay, so um, think of it as sort of a, a like you know like a food categorizer, right? And if we put a food in here that's not on the list, do you think we're still going to get an output? So for example, if I put in here mango, right? If I put in here mango, what's it going to say? Right? Well, no, it actually get you actually get an input. And that input is not starchy and not fruit. Now, if you know what a mango is, you know a mango certainly is delicious. fruit, and it's also delicious, absolutely. So, um, so obviously, if you want to expand this program to ha sort sort of identify things, you would have to put that into these categories. Right now, this this particular program right now only handles oranges, bananas, apples, and potatoes. Okay, so you know, obviously, not a very uh, wide breadth program and that's okay but for the purposes of this particular uh, scenario it's okay for our purposes all right so now um, if we put in Apple what part of the code was returned okay so when we put in Apple we got not citrus and fruit well that not citrus fruit line is which line in the function 17. it's line 17 so that means, if we kind of trace back what was executed here, that means that it looked to see if it was a fruit, or if it was in the list of fruits. And it was. And then once it said that's true, look what happens. On line 14, it gets to another if statement. And it tests to see if it's in citrus. And if it, if it is not in citrus, it will go to the else statement, which says to return not citrus and fruit. Okay, so line 17 was executed here, based on based on the, that that flow. Now, if it found that it wasn't in fruits, it would then instead continue to this else command, which then asks another question: Is it in the starchy list? Okay, and if it's false, then it would return not starchy, not fruit. So. We basically have a series of nested inputs and else's. We have if statements like this one here that are only executed if this first if statement is true. That's called nested branching. Okay, Nested branching is having conditionals inside of other conditionals. Okay, And when I say conditionals, I mean if-then, if-then structures. Okay, 
And of course, that also is controlled by indents. So we can see, for example, that this statement, this if statement right here, is going to execute if food in citrus is true, it'll execute this line only. If there was further code, then it would try to execute that as well. But obviously, since it's a return line, that, that, that stops the function. Return line is, is sort of the terminator for the function, right? So, but if I wanted to say put something else in here, right? I could say print, you know, whatever I want, right? And it will execute that along with returning the value of the function, okay? But obviously, that's not what I want, okay? So, now, question one, sorry, question 2B, okay, uh, asks you to find what inputs would execute certain lines of the function. So, for example, line fit, the first part says 2B and then item number one, and I'm just reading the assignment. What input will cause line 15 to be executed? All right. Well, what's line 15? Returning citrus and fruit. Okay. So out of the inputs that we can provide to this, fru this function, what input can we provide that would return citrus and fruit? What do you think? If the food is in citrus. If the food is in citrus. And what else? If the food is in fruit. If the food is in fruit. Okay. So what, what uh, item fits? What item is in, in fruit and citrus? According to the list of data that we have on lines 8 through 10. Orange. Yeah, it's the orange. So I can type that. And by the way, once again, I forgot. Log start ORT sample 134.log. Okay, so I forgot to start my log. All right. So if I, if I test that, if I type food ID orange, oops, I got to put that in quotes because it's a string, and I get that output. That's line 15. So orange might, would be my answer to 2B. Right? So I would say 2bi orange. Right? And if I want 2b2, what input would cause line 17 to be executed? Wait, are you doing it for us? Sort of. So fun. <laughs> I'm doing a couple for you. What was the question? Okay. What input would what input would cause line 17 to be executed? Well, if the food is not in citrus, but the food also has to be in fruit. So what's an item that's in fruit but not in citrus? Apple. Apple, right. We could do that. What else would work for that? A banana would also work for that. Okay. And that's it. Right. Because those are the items that are in fruits but not in citrus. Okay. So we can kind of see that. Now, I'm not going to spoil all of them for you because there's a third and a fourth one. It's to ask you what, what would execute 20, what would execute 22. So you can answer those on your own. Okay? You will do all of those, of course. Yes. Okay. Now, the other thing I want to go, go over here is that the question 2C states the following. It says, bananas are starchy and the program knows it. But why will line 20 never result in bananas being reported as starchy? Okay. So for example, take a look at this, right? We have a starchy list in our, in our data. Here's our starchy list, line 10. Bananas and potatoes, according to this program, right? But the program will never output that bananas are starchy. You want us to fix that? Okay. Well, I want you to think about why is it that line 20 will never execute when you put banana in? Why will line 20 not execute? Because it's in fruits. That's precisely correct. It is at, it's in this list. And the program does not have a way to do that check. You know? And matter of fact, it's starchy, but it's also a fruit. So, you know, in a way, yeah, we would need another line or something. But that's something that's not being reported that it should be. But it should be being reported, right? So that's kind of a, that's kind of a bug. Right? It's something that's not working as you would intend it to. So sometimes, sometimes to figure out, shh, figure out what works and what doesn't, testers will often write what's called a test suite or, a te uh, or a, another program or another function that actually tests what, how a function's working. So what I've done here is I, I've, I've copied and pasted um, this from the activity and it's a food ID test function 
And I just copied and pasted. It's it's right out. It's right in number three. They define glass box testing, um, and they also devi uh, define test driven design. They also define test driven design for um, for for you. Okay. Now, food ID test is the function. You don't have to worry about changing this function. You just have to kind of try it. So let's let's throw that function. Okay. And if we type in food ID test, it has no arguments. And all it's doing basically is testing to make sure that the function actually works. Okay. Now, the way that this is written, okay, the way that this is written and the way this is executed, then you get, a, you get, you get an output based on that. Now, if there was a bug, if there was a problem, then it would report that problem. Let's say for example, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna modify the program so that you can see what, what would happen. So now, let's say for example that I have orange, but let's say I have orange and citrus, but I don't have it in fruits, okay? So, oops, did I delete the quote? Yeah, I did. So I'm gonna have this list now changed so it's just apples and bananas, okay? So let's throw the function and let's run that food ID test. And then notice now, it tells me that there's a bug. And the bug is the fact that it's not reporting the correct value. So if we look at the test suite, the test suite says this line right here, line number 29. It's checking to make sure that if you do, if you do food ID of orange, that the output is citrus comma fruit, okay? So the expected output is citrus comma fruit. But because of the change that I made to the list, that change caused a different output, okay? That is other than citrus and fruit. So then if that happens, it sends false, it sends the variable of works, which is what this function is kind of writing to, to false. And then it has that following output, that there's a bug in orange. Orange should work that way, it says, okay? So then you also can add other lines to make sure that predicted outputs are supposed to be, are supposed to be happening. So right now, orange and banana are written like this. That's why the test suite works. But you now also have the option of adding in different things. Like for example, if food ID apple, oops, apple, lowercase, okay, does not equal citrus, not citrus, fruit. If I spell citrus right, that would help. Citrus, what's that? Right, fruit, can't type today. All right, so, and we can kind of copy and paste that code, right? We can say that, that there's a, you know, it doesn't work, right? And I got to spell false with a capital F to get it to register. There it goes. Print apple bug found, or apple bug in food ID, right? Two eyes. And just so you know, when I'm, re when, I'm, when I'm recording these videos, I have the, uh, the recording screen on, different, uh, on a different screen the overhead so like I'm looking at the activity on one laptop on my laptop itself but the output is being sent to the board so I'm recording the board and that's why I kind of have to look to the side my typing is not as what it should be um, so you could sort of add those values in just like that now the activity does not necessarily ask you to do that I'm just kind of showing you that that's where you would do it okay and if you want to write test suites for future programs and make sure that outputs are as predicted, that's something that you can, you can do. You have the ability to do that. Checking outputs of functions. You should have things as predictable outputs. Okay? All right. Now, part two, number four. Now, we have a function, but that function is not given to you in Python code, and I'm dragging it in here to show you. Okay? That's number four. Number four says, define a function f of x that implements this flowchart. A flowchart is another way to represent an algorithm. Input and output are in rectangles, and branching decisions are in diamonds. Okay, so you may have, maybe you have seen a flowchart that looks like this. Maybe you haven't, um, but it's sort of a way to give a graphical representation of what a program is doing. Okay, just like we learned about last marking period, right? We learned about kind of what a flowchart is, but this is the first time that you get to take a flowchart and convert it to a program. Okay, so. Fun stuff, right? So here's your starting point. Your starting point of the program is right where this arrow is right here, okay? Now, the first question asks you to decide whether n, the input, is an integer, okay? So the function we're defining here is f of x. It's saying n, the number, number is x, right? It's defining whether or not it's an integer, okay? So the way you check that 
is you check to see if the integer value of n is also equal to itself, right? So that sort of, it's, it's giving you effectively what, what conditional statement you have to use in your program, okay? Int of n double equals n. Now, if that answer is yes, right, following the flowchart, a branching decision, usually there's a yes and there's a no, right? So here's the yes. Then it's going to do something else. If it's no, it's going to report that n is not an integer. Now think, in Python, how do you do that? How do you have it so that if, if this is not true, that it executes this code? What, you use an else statement, exactly, okay? So you would have an if statement here. You would have execution of whatever, you know, if it's true, but your else statement will be print and report that n is not an integer, okay? So that's a print statement. You have to do that, tell, tell the user, hey, sorry, you can't use this function. You can only use it with integers. Now, if it's yes, then you've got another decision. This is a nested branch. So this if statement that follows has to be within the indentation of the previous if statement. Okay? Just like when we were doing the citrus and the fruit thing with, the, with that initial program. So the next question says, asks, is, is n even? Okay? Now, there's a new operator in this statement. n and then a percent sign 2 double equals 0. That percent sign is called a modulus. Okay? A modulus returns the remainder of a division problem. Okay? So in other words, if you do 4 mod 2, the output is 0. If you do 7 mod 2, the output is 1, because the 7 divided by 2 is, is 3 remainder 1. Okay? So, so this function here, this statement here, is going to check to see if n is even. Well, n's even when there's no remainder and you divide it by 2, right? So that's why this statement works, okay? So if you have a yes, if you have a yes, you have another if statement to ask. If it's a no, how do you do no again? Else, you have to report that n is an odd number, okay? So if it's yes, you get another decision. You're going to check to see if it's divisible by 3, right? So n mod 3, does that equal 0? If it doesn't, you report that it's even. If it does, you would report that n's a multiple of 6, and then your function's done, okay? So this is effectively one if statement at the beginning. Use a mouse. One if statement at the beginning. Another if statement within there, and then you would need another if statement. So you'll have a three deep level of if, if statements. So you got to watch your indents. Make sure that you're indenting the right amount when you write this function. Okay? And you should of course get a predictable set of outputs for that. So no, you don't have to write. By the way, just in case you want to know, you do not have to write a test suite for this program. Okay? You don't have to test, you know, but, but you should, obviously, make sure that if you type in f of 2, it should tell you it's even. If you type f of 13, it should tell you it's odd. If you type f of 13.5, it should tell you that's not an integer. So all of your outputs should be predictable. And if you're not getting the correct outputs, you got a bug. you got to fix it. Okay? All right, you got a question. Go ahead. Yeah, when you're doing uh, if, if else statements, right, uh, first you have if. No, in Python, in Python, you only have to write the if you have you have to write it on the next line. So like, take a look at this, right? If you're writing if food ID equals that, there's your there's a conditional statement. Close it off exactly. with the colon. So it, so it, we call it an if then structure, but you don't actually have to use the word then yeah, okay. in Python. Okay, good but question. You, have to, you, have to use else if it's not you do have to use else for the false for for the false of that. Yes, question. Go ahead. So what, so what you're saying is when you typed in mango, then you got an output of citrus? No, I, no, I'm sorry. No, how did you, you know when you did that while you were recording and you typed in mango? Uh-huh. How did you get an output of that? Did you type in mango? It doesn't, because that, because it, that data is not input into the program. Yeah. We would have to put that in the right lists for it to quote unquote work. So the question was, why was it, why did mango report as not starchy, not fruit? So Ooh. that's sort of our, let's call it default response. Let's say if it's, a, if, it's, if it's something that's not in one of those lists, that's going to be the output. Okay. Right? So we know that's not true because we're human, but computers don't. We have to tell computers everything. Right? And, and that's sort of another one of those little sort of overall uh, things. That sort of overall ar overarching concepts is if we want computers to do something, we have to tell it to do that. You know, Watson is an example. Watson, the Jeopardy thing, right? That thing had to be programmed with a lot of branches. Okay? So to, to say the least. Okay, another question, then we'll move on. 
All right, well, try to next time ask that. Not now. <laughs> so, all right. Okay, we'll hold it. We'll, we'll hold, hold on to that for a second. We got one more thing to show you, and then we'll be able to we'll be able to um, get some work time in. Okay, one more thing we're going to show you is we're going to show you the raw input function. Okay, now this is not my examples here are not necessarily based on the um, based on the activity, but I do want to show you kind of how how it how it works. Okay, so here's the raw input function. We'll use up we'll use raw um, the IPython to show you. All right, raw input of type something here. Okay. If I put that into IPython, it's going to bring up a prompt, but that prompt will of course be preceded by what I type inside the parentheses. All right? So type something here. Right? And then it will return what was typed. So the raw input function basically gets a response from the user. Okay? But it gets a response from the user and returns a string of that response. Okay? So when I typed in something here, that something here was a string. Okay? Now if I ask for a number, you know, if I say I, I want to type in, I want to do raw input, I want to get a number, then that number is also going to be a string. Okay? So let's try this for example. Watch this. A equals raw input Give me a number between five and six. All right. So if I type that in, it's going to prompt me for a number, 5.2, for example. I press enter. Now that variable has been stored in A. But notice how it's been stored. A it's a string. So if I want to do, let's say, B equals five, and then try to do A plus B, I'm going to get a type error. You can't add a string in an integer. So what's the way around that? What's the way around that? And just so you know, there's the type, just so you, just so you can see, right? There, by the way, there's another function right there. You can use the type of a variable to tell what type of variable it is. Okay, the type function does that. So what do I have to do? I have to use the, whoops, I can't do that because it's not an integer. Float of A plus B. There you go, okay? I have to use it, so I have to do a type change in order to use that in the, in, in the way I want to use that. I also, by the way, can do this. I can say A equals the float of the raw input of number from 5 to 6, right? And I have to put that in the string. So I can use... That value is, well, I forgot to close the parentheses. Okay, number from 5 to 6, 5.5, .5, right? And now A is now listed as a float. If I type A, it's a float, okay? So you also have the option of converting the raw input directly by using a nested function. <gasps> There's another word. There's that word again, right? So what I did here was, remember, it's just like in math, we kind of work the way, work the way from the inside out. So we have raw input of that number, but then what are we going to do? We're going to take that raw input value and we're going to convert it to a float. All right. So your basic basic out for that is since raw input only uses strings by 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 nature, you can if you want to use it as a number and you are going to use it obviously in number seven and eight, then you're going to get that. Uh, you're going to have to convert that for using a float or an int function. Um, it's it didn't come up for me, but you may get the following. I'm just going to show you as a comment. If you type the type of A, sometimes may get something called Unicode. Okay, you may get something called Unicode. That actually is an extension of of ASCII characters, which is sort of the main 255 character uh, library that we use in the United States for for letters and numbers and symbols and things on your keyboard. Um, Unicode is an extension of that. It's called UTF-8, Unicode Text Format 8, 8-bit uh, 8 format that is. And that, if you sometimes type in a string, you may get an output that looks like this, U apostrophe 5.5, right? If it's a string. That U means Unicode. That doesn't happen uh, for everybody. That may happen to a couple of you, but for the most part, it'll type it and keep it as a string, and then you won't have to worry about that. But just in case, just in case it happens. All right. So I'll close off with the, with the following. In number seven, they give you a function, and that function works as is, and then they have you test that function. 
but then they have you add to that function using a couple of um, random numbers and a couple of um, extra prompts that it wants you to throw in there. So just read that carefully. And then in number eight, they ask you to write a decimal quiz to determine whether a number is between uh, two other numbers, sort of like a like an understanding kind of thing. You, you read about it in number eight, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Okay. So this lesson here about nesting and branching is over. Have a nice day.